Hi everyone, I'm here with Josh Falkingham for episode 5 of the Talking Town podcast. How are you doing Josh? Yeah, fine, thank you. Fine, all good. So we'll start with quick fire questions like we usually do. Favourite film? Um, I'm a Denzel Washington man, um, so a, a classic uh, Man on Fire, probably the one that sticks out for me. Favourite TV show? Um, uh, there's a few to be fair, I like my Netflix, but at the minute I'm watching Sons of Anarchy. Okay, cool, cool. Which I'm happy with. Favourite song or album? And or both, if you can think of them. I don't think I've got really a favourite song. I'm a, I'll go with probably what all the lads normally go with, something like Drake, who I listen to probably at the moment, I think is the most current. So, yeah, he's anything, any time he brings a tune out, I think it's um, everybody loves it. Have you not got one for the last few years, like a favourite? <laughs> no, 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 probably, no, no, no. Anything, that, um, especially when you're on a night out or out, if, uh, yeah, 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 as long as it's good with a drink in your hand, I think we're all good. Yeah. Dream job as a child? Um, obviously a professional footballer, so living the dream really. Footballing hero? My footballing hero, um, I'm a massive Leeds fan, grew up obviously being at Leeds and stuff like that, so um, my role model and who I always wanted to be like was uh, a guy called David Batter. Yeah, I just felt that he played the way that, I'd, you know, growing up that's exactly how I wanted to play, keep the ball simple, win tackles, always loved by the fans and um, just from his hard work. He went a lot of time unnoticed, but for me, David Batty, when he was at Leeds, he was he was brilliant, and I, I loved him. You know, what I mean, when I used to go to the games with my dad, and that it was just, it was great. So that brings me on to my next question: Is that your earliest memory of football, like the games with your dad? And yeah, Leeds? I was like I say, I got picked up by Leeds at a really young age, at eight, seven or eight. Um, I only managed to play one year with um, Rothwell Town, which was my local town, my local side, obviously. Um, and that was at six years old. I think we had mini soccer, it was, for a year. And then from there, from playing with school, um, I went to a, a great primary school with a head teacher that was just, I think, nowadays he won't be allowed because all he was about was sport. He loved football, obviously. He was a huge football fan, but it wasn't just sport. He wanted to win. And um, from my earliest memories from growing up, he was Mr Rossett, I'll give him a um, shout-out kind of thing. But he was he was brilliant. Um and like I say, I got picked up from an early age, eight really, seven or eight, and then went, went straight into the Leeds Academy, which back then was a massive, massive thing. And it still is now, I'm not saying it mm. now, but obviously back back when I was growing up, Leeds were Premier League fighting for the you know, top four spots, top six spots, um, and, and, and getting a little bit older, the Champion League runs that they went on and stuff like that was, was brilliant. And so as a kid, it was, it was great to watch and great to be involved in really because I was obviously part of the club. So do you mind talking us through your playing career from like the Leeds days to Harrogate Town? Yeah, uh, as I've just mentioned got, yeah. got picked up early and I was lucky enough to go through all the way through the academy um, from the age of eight, seven or eight to 19 when I actually left. Um, some great players that I've played with, some that have gone on to do brilliant things. Um, my youth team on my youth team and the year below we were real strong through the national through the national as well we used to win a lot of games and you know we travelled into Italy uh, Belgium we used to go on trips um, as a group and we used to come back with you know a lot of trophies and things like that because we would had the likes of well talking of one that's been here as well Michael Woods obviously got picked up at 16 and went to Chelsea Tom Tyu another Ben Gordon they were, they were three lads that went to Chelsea. You had Danny Rose, who left us at 17 and went to Tottenham. Um, obviously, Fabian Delph, um, who stayed with Leeds, managed to break through um, and went on to have, well, he's had an unbelievable career, won Premier League titles. Um, Tom Lees at Sheffield Wednesday, who went on to play for Leeds as well, who's now the Sheffield Wednesday captain. Lo- like a lot of names, which a lot of the time when you're growing up, maybe one or two maybe might go on, but we had a, a real good, good bunch. Um, and 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 have gone on to have successful footballing careers and like I say I got to a stage where unfortunately chopping of managers um, it was going really well under Gary McAllister but unfortunately he got the sack um, which didn't bode well for me um, and Leeds brought in Simon Grayson which looking back you know si- Grayson come in wanted to do a job and his job was to get Leeds promoted as quick as possible and I think he brought in the record amount of loan players he mm. just kept rotating in terms of one month an experienced lad had come in another lad like, and there were bunches 
and I think they went up to ended up being squad number forty four or what have you. So that just showed in that one year how many how many plays he, he, he had and he wasn't really focused on the youth. Um, unfortunately for me, and, and, and that's when uh, I, re- I, got, I got released by Leeds um, in January 2010 and kind of come at a bit of a crossroads. What do I do? 19 years old, not had any first-team football experience. Mm. Um, went on trial at Bury for about five or six weeks. The weather, I remember that year, um, was horrendous. Um, and unfortunately... Um, Nothing materialised under Alan Nil, who's now at Sheffield United's number two, to Chris Wilder. Um, and he just said, look, unfortunately, I can't do all with you. Um, and then a phone call off an agent basically asked, would I go to Scotland? Would I would I go do it? And I absolutely snapped his hand off. And luckily, um, I managed to go up to St. Johnson under Derek McInnes. Um and he managed to give me a, a contract. I played in a trial game, did really well, and, and, and literally went from nothing to being on the bench at Celtic Park. Um, I signed on the Friday, and like I say, was a, was on the bench in front of, like, at Celtic Park, which is an incredible stadium, in front of, I think there were 40 or 45,000 there. Um, because at that time, they wasn't doing too great under Tony Mowbray. Mm. Um, so if it had been, you know, when they're flying high, do you get 50, 60,000 week in, week out, no matter who they play, which is which is incredible. And then, like I said, he did really well, really enjoyed it. But St. Johnson, again, money comes into play with youngsters. If you're not ready to play first-team football, like there's no point. They, that, that's how they looked at it. Um, and unfortunately, I just want right. I felt that I deserved something. I've been making my debut and things like that. But um, the chairman at the time, Derek McKinney, said to me that he just said, look, they're on a tight ship here and unfortunately we can't have any like, passengers for the time being. We uh, have to play. Um, I wanted to give you a contract, but I, I, I'm, I'm not the man that hands out the contracts in terms of the money and the budgets and things like that. So, But he looked after me massively at the point at that time. Um, a few lads got released um, and an experienced guy who'd been at St. Johnson for six, seven, eight years, might even been 10 years actually, Paul Sheeran. Um, he left the club at the same time as me in the same summer and he went and got the hard rough, play manager's role which they were um, in the lowest league, in the lowest division in Scotland. But obviously having to get to know Paul, um, knew what you were about, he was straight on the phone to me. And what what Derek allowed me to do as well was train with St. Johnson first team, which at the time was filled with Jordy Morris, Michael Duvery, um, some really good players, do you know what I mean? And, and, and English lads as well. So I was able to settle in with, with them, they looked after me and I was able to, thankfully to him, play part-time with our bro but really stay full-time because I was able to play with and train with day in, day out with St. Johnson's first team. So it was kind of a great combination, one that I'd have probably done if I'd have probably signed a prof- like another contract at St. Johnson um, because that's what he was looking to do with me anyway if, if, if I would have signed a new deal in terms of he'd have wanted me to get out and play some first-team games and, and, and that's kind of what I ended up doing. I had two successful, brilliant seasons at 19 years old, just wanted to play games. Um, and, and racked up 70 odd 80 games for our growth in two seasons which for me that was exactly what, what a perfect thing we managed to win the league that I think in our growth history of 120 odd years they never won a title cool. um, so it was kind of something that I never knew before joining the yeah. club but for us to win the first trophy that they'd ever won um, in the whole history the first league title it was you know it made it a little bit more sweeter um, and we were unfortunate really not to get promoted the following year because we finished in the playoffs I felt that we were probably we finished second but playoffs being playoffs and a bit of a, a lottery yeah. it never worked out and we got stumped against I think it was Dumbarton at the time and um, we never managed to do that and then from there um, the summer time I was always wanting to get back into full time football and luckily Jim Jeffries oh. phoned me um, a really experienced guy in Scotland had an unbelievable managing career actually come down to England as well and managed in the Premier League for Bradford and Benito Carboni players like that was at Bradford so yeah the Jet as he was nicknamed in um, in Scotland I met him so, and he was the manager at Dunfermline at the time who had just been relegated from the, the Premier League the Premiership um, and dropped into the Championship so it was another step up for me and one that I massively touched straight away snapped his hand off and, and to work with somebody like himself with a wealth of experience that he had from day one I knew it would be a good you know a good 
relationship in terms of helping me to you know hopefully improve my career and, and get better and better um and probably for me one of the best managers that i've worked with a bit old school but to be fair um that's exactly kind of what i liked in terms of come game day and, and after games and stuff if if you've not done it right or you've not you've not been on it he was more than happy to tell you mm. and <laughs> in yeah. more circumstances you know he'd go to above and beyond we're telling you and coming down hard on you but likewise on the flip side if you did well for him there was not a better manager to play for do you know what I mean he, he praised you to the hills and um, and really spoke highly do you know what I mean of you if you if you'd done well for him and we managed to obviously do that um, but at the club again in my first year it was crazy and the club went into liquidation um, which was which was crazy by the January some lads the experienced lads who had families, you know, obviously had mortgages, and we was only getting paid 20% of wages on this day, then maybe another 10% had come that day, and it was just all over the place. But luckily for me, being a young lad and not being one of the highest earners, obviously I had no family, no, I was living in a club flat that was yeah. paid by the club and everything, so I didn't, you know, the money to me, obviously I needed it like everybody needs it, but it wasn't as important and to to the to guys who were more experienced and it got to the point where we got brought in i think it might have been february time i can't remember exactly the day um where the administrators took us in and said look it's either going in complete bust or and the red off eight or nine names can you please go into that room the rest of you stay in this room and literally from that day the 89 who were the ice turners, the more experienced lads got told unfortunately that's it for this comp- club to continue you're going to have to leave right now so that right there and then they'd be gone from teammates of ours who where we was fighting for the title as well at the point yeah. who was second in the league um, I think we went top on January 1st so that's how crazy it was that year um, to then being no, they weren't teammates anymore and going forward I think I went up to being 22, 23 and one of the experienced lads which was which was crazy whereas you know in any other squad you're one of the young lads you know coming mm-hmm. through you're needing that experience to help you but you got fr- we got thrown straight in at the deep end because the club had no option it had to be done we then got hit with a 15 point deduction that same league which threw us from first and second right down into relegation fight um we wasn't allowed to sign obviously any players to help us so we had to really do as best as best we could and i think we, we did pick up some good results and if it wasn't for a ridiculous refereeing decision on the final day away at Park Thistle, I think we'd have, we'd have stayed up that year. But what happened was we ended up going into a, a relegation playoff, it was called. They do it a little oh, bit yeah, different, yeah. where yeah. second bottom going to a playoff with second, third and fourth mm. in the league below. We, got to, we managed to win the semi-final, got to the final and over two legs. We ended up losing to Aloha, I think it was. Um, and who were under Paul Hartley, um, and and it just we just went out of steam, completely went out of steam. We'd given him everything, um, we'd given everything, sorry, uh, and it just wasn't to be. So we dropped into League One, and at that time Rangers had gone into liquidation, so they ended up meeting us in Scottish League One. So I think we finished second by 10, 15 points. Rangers obviously won it by another 10, 15 points the following season. Um, and unfortunately, again, playoffs just wasn't meant to be, which we should have done that year. We really should have done. Um, but I think, I can't remember who we got beat to. Uh, and then Jim decided to walk, and finally, um, they got they replaced Jim. I think he'd just come to the end of his career in terms of he'd lost that little bit between his teeth. He kind of openly admitted that himself. And it was a real shame to see because, you know, a guy that had lived in brief football, mm. and he, I'm, I'm sure he still does. He, I think he was at the age of 66, 67, that kind of age. Um, it was just one step too far in terms of he kind of when he said he, he lost it he, he well and truly lost it and the best thing for him to do and for the club was to part companies and unfortunately that's how Jim left um, they brought in a new manager Alan Johnson and we managed to win the league the following year oh, cool. in my fourth season um, I played 32-35 games over the season but I don't know what it was just never really saw eye to eye with a manager and that's what can sometimes happen in football I didn't think that I did anything wrong don't know really what happened just maybe a clash of personalities well it happens in life as well doesn't yeah, it? yeah exactly yeah. 
Um, and but likewise, I played as as like I say, I was one of the ones that played the majority of the game. So I, even I still look back with confusion because at the time I absolutely lived and breathed Dunfermline. I lived in the town. You know, the fans were brilliant with me. My family absolutely loved it, and I would have more than happily stayed and continued. You know, obviously trying to get Dunfermline, which I believe are a Premier League club. But it wasn't to be, and again I got let go. And because I'd obviously not really had a house, I was living in um, club accommodation. Mm. I had to come back home. I had an agent at the time. Nothing really again happened. Football, you know, the cycle where the scrap heap come end the seasons of players out of contracts fighting for their lives really, and mm. it was just nothing were coming up. Nothing were happening. I'd played, you know, over 150 games for Dunfermline as well as my 80. So I felt that. At that time, 25, 26, I was at a great age as well to kick on. Um, and I, I had so, I had games behind me, so I was absolutely in a state of shock, really, in terms of what's happening here. Like, But yeah. it was a real lesson in, in, in football for me where it just showed the actual ruthlessness of the business that we're in. It's, people look at it and say, you know, privilege, like they work this and that amount of hours a day, which is true, but... When it's your life and when it's your, you know, your, your job and, and and it's your only income, and then all of a sudden you can be thrown away and and nothing really happens and nobody looks after you in terms of getting you another club or you might have an agent but what is he actually doing for you and things like that. It was a real wake up call in terms of wow this is this is real life. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. um, whatever I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna have to do it myself and. I, you know, eventually, back end of August, I waited and waited and waited, held out, wanted to be full-time football, but just nothing was coming up. And uh, I come back home, obviously, so I wasn't in Scotland, so it was hard for me to go in and train with any other Scottish clubs and things like that um, and try and earn myself a contract because I had no accommodation, I had nowhere to stay. Um, and then I got on the phone and I kind of went Conference North straight away, National League North, and the first club kind of did it in alphabetical order was Darlington. And I knew one lad there called uh, a lad Nathan Cartman. I spoke to Nathan, um, and he was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." I spoke to the manager Martin Gray, and he just said, "Yeah, absolutely, come in." I didn't even really. I think I had two minutes on the phone. I, I were in a bit of a nervous situation. What do you say? How do you introduce yourself? But straight away he just said, "Yeah, come and train." And I obviously signed a contract with with Darlington for a year, um, and we had a good season. Again, I was just like, "No way!" Come the end of it. We find, managed to finish fourth in the division, chance of playoff, chance of going up. And the club got told that uh, because of the stadium that they're in and the seating, I think it was, they couldn't accommodate to go into the higher league. So oh, wow. we ended up finishing fourth that year yeah. um, and having to not be able to play in the playoffs. So it was crazy. But I was also, again, knowing that that year it was a case of showcasing myself back home, getting a name for myself down, you know, closer to home and uh, trying to get back in a full-time football because that's all I've ever known. That's all I've done from eight years old. Um, and luckily, um, I had two good games against Harrogate. Um, okay. And looking at this, uh, looking at the um, league itself, Harrogate were the closest to home. It was a perfect club, really. Um, and luckily, the gaffer. Um, met him a couple of times towards the back, once towards the back end of the season and then once again in the summer. We clicked straight away and obviously he offered me a deal and... Um, I, I managed to, you know, Harrogate going full time. It just absolutely fell perfectly, really, and that hard work of that year really, really paid off. And obviously, I'm here today. We've had three, uh, two, two and a half really good seasons, and hopefully, we can only go on and get better and better and, and strive. Because my dream, ultimate dream, was to play in the football league, and fingers crossed, that's what I can do with Harrogate. Thanks, that that was really interesting. Yeah, 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 no um, So, throughout that career, who would you say the best player you played with was and also who you played against? Um, growing up, um, Fabian Delph, the best player. You can, you know, he's he was very wiry. You know, he played centre midfield with me, yeah. so I played a lot of games with Fabs. And he were, he were brilliant in terms of he had a bite that, you know, he'd fly into tackles and likewise myself. And if he were doing it, I were doing it. And, and, and he really had a, you know, infectious personality in terms of he made other people around him do it. Um, and he had the quality. He could glide past people. Um, he had a passing. He, he, his passing, obviously, his real strength. He could see a pass, his awareness. Yet he'd keep it simple when he needed to. Um, and to see what he's done in his career, it's 
been unbelievable. And like I say, I grew up a lot of years with him, so it makes it even more, you know, special to see somebody like that achieve what he has achieved. Is is, is brilliant. And uh, against, what do you say? Against a tough one, really, because you played against that many players. Yeah, you know, yeah. you, you you get asked this question, and and you kind of like. God, if, if we were just chatting and not doing this right yeah, now, yeah. I'd probably reel off a load of names and, and say this one, this one, this one. There's no one you thought like you've been playing against them and you've been like, please leave me alone. Yeah. One that yeah. I, whilst in Scotland, I had a really tough time against, and I think at the time he was about 36, 37, so he really, and I was a young lad, and you'd have thought that I'd have had the legs, but he's now the manager at Preston, um, oh, Alex yeah. Neil. Yeah. He was at Hamilton, and he was like player manager as well, so... Yeah. He didn't really play himself every week. And I always remember that game, playing for Dunfermline, sticking out, thinking, oh, I'm going to test myself here against, obviously, somebody who had a great playing career. Mm. And I'd like to think I'll get the better of him. But he absolutely okay. gave me a bit of a lesson, really, in yeah. terms of um, when he sucked me in, he'd pop it round me. And when I'd stand off him, he'd take his time and suck me. In. So yeah. he really did, you know, he anchored the midfield for Hamilton at the time, being a manager as well. And, you know, what he's gone on to do, um, champion, he's in the championship now with Preston. I think he got Norwich promoted as well. Yeah. He, he got the Norwich job first and foremost, um, and he's obviously now at Preston. Um, yeah, just randomly like that, something come to my mind, and yeah, he, he really did give me a bit of a, a lesson for ninety minutes, really. So, like, just from talking to you now, you seem like a really strong character, like really passionate about football. And while I was doing a bit of research, I noticed that a lot of the clubs you've been at, you've been captain. What would you say are like your main attributes where people like trust you to have that role? Yeah, interesting. I have I have had um, the captaincy growing up um, a lot of the time, even in the youth teams and, yeah. and in the academy setups and stuff like that. Um, I don't know really. It's just I, I never try and as much as I love being a captain. You know, I love probably the position that I play and the lad that I am. Um, and when growing up, and like I say, even like to watching like to David Batty. Um, I loved Alan Smith. He was from my area, you know, from Leeds. Yeah. Really had that fire, like he could really, you know, if times were tough or he wasn't having a bit, he'd, he'd always be giving hundred percent. He'd, he'd go into tackles. Leeds at the time had Lee Boyer, who mm. were another feisty character. And I don't know whether it would just feel that from growing up and watching these kind of players, um, really kind of made me be that. I don't know because I think that really when I talked about, you know. Being at primary school, I, I really had it in me from then. So yeah, I just I, I just try and be myself, try and be the best that, that I can be. You know, I don't try and be anybody else. I don't try and please anybody else. It is who I am, and you know, I live by what I do. In terms of if, if I feel that I've got something to say, I'll say it. You know, if I if I feel that it's time to maybe take a back seat, then then that's how it is. But you know, obviously, if, if managers have, have seen that in me, then. You know, it's obviously a really nice thing to to get is the captaincy because it is a huge role. It is a it's a it's an honourable thing to do, and um, when you're given it, you, you do take on responsibilities. I had it when I was really young. I managed to, in the end getting it at Dunfermline at 22. Do you know what I mean? 23. Um, probably did some things then, which yeah, now I was I've learned. At that time, because you said like a lot of the older players left, and then. So that left you to be captain. Do you think that made you grow up like quite a bit? Or yeah, my, it definitely made me grow up. Yeah. Um, and looking back, I'll, I've learned now a lot as well. When I got it instantly, I felt that maybe now I need to shout and scream and yeah. maybe do some things that I was trying not. I was trying to be somebody else. As much as captaincy is renowned for getting people going, I maybe went above and beyond in terms of sometimes I didn't need to say it. But when I was so young and I got caught up in a moment. Maybe I said things and, and shouted things at certain at wrong times, really. Um, and now looking back, I definitely it definitely made me grow up one thousand percent. And it definitely looking back made me learn as well because I ended up getting Jim Jeffries was harsh to me. I didn't sign a new contract when he wanted me to and strip the captaincy off me. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So I, I big time, you know, learned a lot of lessons in that in that period. And um, I think that now I'm a much better captain in terms of from what I was to now what I am now. So since you've joined Harrogate, you've got quite involved in the coaching side. Is this your first like venture into coaching, or how, and how has it been? Yeah, um, this is my first real um, coaching venture. Um, I actually did my UEFA B license when I was about 24, 25, while I was up in Scotland, because it was always something that people around me I always really enjoyed, you know, and I always wanted to plan ahead in terms of when I stop playing, all I've ever known is football. So if I if I did it younger, it'll allow me, you know. 
to just get it behind me. Mm. And then when I want to go into that coaching side of it, then I'd be able to, I'd have the, the badges behind me. But I did mention it to the gaffer when, when we met up. And I mentioned that I had my B, B licence at the time and I was looking to maybe, when I was getting back home, that was the thing. When I went full time, when I was going to go back full time, and obviously I was given the opportunity to go back full time with Harrogate, I didn't want to waste my my, my free time, yeah. as like you say, because a lot of footballers, a lot of young lads do do that. But I felt like I got to an age where whether it had been, well, I did explain to the gaffer at the time, whether it now being back home, do I want to try and go and get an academy job, you know, a, a lead to go and get a coaching role in the academy, or would I, would there be opportunities? And the gaffer kind of come to me and said, folks, look. There's this opportunity. Would you be interested in? When we're playing day in day out, I felt it was a perfect and the right thing to do by, you know, keeping it in house, being able to learn off the gaffer, off Furs, off um, the management here at this club. I felt it was an absolute perfect opportunity. So I was I was delighted when I got it, and it's been a brilliant two and a half years. Which again, another learning a learning curve for me really in terms of from when I got it two and a half years ago to now. I feel like I'm a much more better coach and, and, and a better manager of, of, of my side, do you know what I mean, that I run. Good. Did you win the league last season? Or was it for the first two yeah. years, yeah, yeah, yeah won it for the, my first year oh, um, oh, and cool. won it, the, you know, last year as well and obviously I'll be looking to do the same again this year. The league itself, now that we see, you know, I've got a really good bunch this year. Mm. It's probably not the strongest league but what my, my pleasing thing that I've been able to do is get the majority of my lads all playing Saturday football and all, you know, not having to pay to play football really and yeah. out of the 15 of my squad I think 10 of them are all out doing that so that's been a really pleasing thing for me I managed to get them in training with the first team and the, the end goal obviously if I can is to try and get them playing Saturday football get them doing brilliantly for me which they are doing at the minute and the end goal for me is if I can get one to get a first team contract would be would be amazing and another question from what well, I was meaning to ask so I turned the TV on the other week uh, football focus yeah. saw a familiar face what was that like being I don't know like for your career if you've had like been on TV a lot or anything but while you, Harrogate have been promoted um, I know BT Sport cover National League games you've been on football focus like, is, what's that been like has it been extra scrutiny or has it been just fun no it's, it's been really enjoyable to be honest it's a bit yeah. of weird like, or... yeah like growing up football focus when I yeah. won I wasn't really lucky yeah. one of the lucky ones who had Sky so yeah. you know growing up football focus was um was the, the one that you tuned into as a kid yeah. growing up. Do you know what I mean? BBC One. Uh, I remember the grandstand on it that used to have like sports on every Saturday oh, yeah, and yeah. stuff like yeah. that. So, um, yeah, Football Focus would a highlight because that was the only kind of football that the BBC kind of had for an hour um, and, and always obviously used to watch it when I could. Um, so it was a bit of a surreal kind of feeling being on it. I know I only ended up getting about 20 oh, yeah. seconds yeah. of coverage, which were, were not ideal, but... Um, yeah, like I say, the, the coverage that the club's getting from, you know, the media, what BT do down here as well in the National League, the coverage that you get as a player, you're probably on more times on TV in front of the camera than you are if you played League One, League Two. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's crazy to think that, yeah. but for a, for a player, it's always brilliant. When I was younger, a little bit like I played on TV, on uh, played on in the Scottish Cup for Arbroath against Rangers and things like that. And, that was my first time and even now when I look back I've learned from that do you know what I mean or I'm, I'm just a little bit older and a little bit wiser in terms of it's just another game whereas when you used to be on TV when you're a bit younger you think oh this is my opportunity this is this is a this is a big thing where I can yeah. you know maybe get myself a massive move or a big a big club might be watching or somebody might be watching I might and you put end up putting too much pressure on yourself and end up ruining them days because I look back and Unfortunately, I didn't really enjoy them and I didn't play to the best of my abilities because of putting that added pressure. Whereas now, when we're on TV, I look forward to it. It's a real game that you want to go into and you're not too focusing on, I need to play well, I need to play well, I need to play well. You're just focusing on what you, what your job is and what you're there to do and, and that's why it's, it's, it's really enjoyable and I, I honestly do love, love when the cameras are here or we get the media exposure that we do and we are doing at the minute. Um, it's it's things that you need to grab at. And just a quick one, stay on the TV. So you, the Portsmouth game was on TV. I was in the ground, but um, for me there wasn't like a, that much difference between the two sides, in my opinion. Was that like a, a real positive for the team, knowing that apart from arguably two really t well taken goals, you went like head to head 
for the League One team and played really well. Yeah, that's all we can ask for. You know, in them games, in them one-off games, um, you always obviously want to get a result. Yeah. But secondly, you want to give it your best shot and make sure that when you finish after the game or whatever, you can look back now that we can look back two or three weeks later and go, you know what, you know, we, we're giving them a great account of ourselves. We put everything into it. We played as well as we could have done. And unfortunately, it wasn't to be. And, and, and that's exactly what it felt like. Obviously, I've not been as gutted after a game of football for a long, long time. I'll mm. tell you that, you know, in terms of two, three days later, four days, you know, like it really gutted me. And I know it gutted a few of the lads. Like it was it was a tough pill to swallow and it, it took a few days to get it out of the system kind of thing. But looking back now, yeah, it were a, it were a good, ex- it were, well, it were a great experience. It was great coverage for the club. It was great coverage for how we played and, 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 and the respect that we got off Portsmouth, off the media, off the coverage that we got, and off the obviously the crowd that was in here, and 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 last of all, like like I say, for the fans and who turn up week in week out, I'm sure they had just as good a night as as we all did. Do you know what I mean? And it was just a real shame that looking back, first of all, when you if you'd have asked me that question two minutes after the game, I said we probably should have won, we should have won, we should have won. Yeah. But looking back now, we should have definitely got a result in terms of if it had been a draw, a replay. And then another game, another shot at it. To finish off, we'll go to fan questions. Yeah. Best away win of the season so far and best atmosphere. That one's from Jack Wilkinson. The best away for me that stands out is Yeovil. Um, going to Yeovil, a lot of trip. You know, they've been flying. I think that I can't remember how many games they'd won at home. I don't think they've been beaten. Um, I might be wrong on that, but I know for a fact that they had a lot of good results, a lot of positive results at home. Um, and obviously a club that had just dropped out of League Two. Um, they've been in League One a lot of years. Um, I felt that going there, we had a game plan, and we massively pulled it off. We quietened them from minute one. We managed to get the two goals, and we ran out fully deserved winners. It wasn't like a smashing grab. It was something that we really, really deserved. So, um, yeah, that one stands out this season for the for the best result and best atmosphere. Got a question from Ross. That's I can't pronounce his surname. Sorry, <laughs> Ross. Um, but what was it like playing at Ibrox? Yeah, like like I say, that was one that stands out for me, and I always get asked. Obviously, playing in Scotland, they they're the two clubs that everybody knows and everybody talks about. Um, it was uh, I managed to play there three or four times, and managed to the one that stands out. Obviously, I managed to score at Ibrox as well, which were uh, a Tuesday, Wednesday night. My my, my dad, my family had, had travelled up the night as well, so oh, cool. they made the the long journey up. Um, and when you go to Ibrox, as much as it's a forty. 45,000, 50,000 seat stadium. The away fans only get like a select few. Yeah. You know, they're really shoved into a corner. So for my dad to see that, um, I think we ran out 2 1, 2 1, 3 1 defeat. But um, to score in front of 43,000, um, you know, it's looking back now, as much as it doesn't mean much, it kind of stands out for me that I was I was lucky enough to be able to do that. But yeah, really, really enjoyed it and um, a fantastic fantastic stadium when you pull up to it it's got a real special feeling to it um, and when you when you walk out I'll never forget walking out with the big massive flags that they've got swaying in front and you yeah. just hear um, Tina Turner simply the best and it starts just booming it's just it was just incredible atmosphere do you know what I mean and uh, one that you knew here we go like <laughs> roll your sleeves up it's going to be you know what I mean if, if you don't and we had a couple of results where we got you know a really good scene too, in terms of we got drubbed I think 4-0 one of the times it were it were a long long, long night so yeah. no it were it were it was special and it were brilliant and it's a a massive massive football club John Oway uh, sent in uh, do you have any influence slash input on team selection for Harrogate no, no. <laughs> unless the manager comes to yeah. me uh, if he ever wants to ask me a question and might get my thoughts but no um, you know first I'm, I'm, I'm a player like my job is to make sure that we get the right results so we, yeah. you know um, if I'm lucky enough to get the shirt, do you know what I mean? You need to keep it. So my my thoughts are basically about myself and just making sure and trying to do what's best for the team so that I stay in it, basically. Um, the gaffers and, and players make them decisions. Yeah. If, 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 and we have, obviously I've got a really close relationship with a gaffer. If he does come to me, ask for my personal opinion. I'm not scared to, you know what I mean, not afraid to say what I think. And, and, and likewise, he, he'll he tell me mm. what he thinks as well. So it's, it's a great relationship that I've got. Um, but no, I don't have any kind of 
influence or yeah. input on the team selection. Yeah. That's the uh, that's the gaffer's job. Yeah. Another one from Chris Halson. What's the best team talk you've been given? Best team talk? It'd be a fair few, really. Like, yeah. there's a lot there that not not you know if, if people want like you know if they want in me to say like exactly do I remember yeah. one or whatever. I'm not really probably been in a situation where that's happened. So and then the last question from Stephen Donahue. Um, which I found it quite a funny question actually but do you have any do you have more leeway with what you can say to the referee when you wear the captain's arm because like I know you're a very local player yeah 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 I think obviously fans probably see me like constantly speaking to the referee but I think that's I've always been it's not just since I've been given the captain's arm or anything like that I think if uh, if I didn't have the armband I'd be constantly um, and I try I honestly try my best to stay away from him and try and let him just do it but I seem to say just once the game kicks off and once you're in you're in it like it's it's so hard to to get away from it because there's that many how can I say it nicely without getting into trouble that the inconsistency that's what yeah. players get really frustrated with and if you know certain things get picked up on the referee starts giving free kicks for, for one thing and then we get it in the same but don't get a free kick for it or we don't get it we don't get anything happen because of it, then that, when as a player, and especially somebody like myself, gets massively frustrated. But something that I need to learn, probably, I need to make sure that I get better at. But like I say, I do try my best, I promise you. <laughs> but no, it's um, there's no real leeway. I can't really say anything. We All the thing that is, is the captains go in before the game, have a quick chat with a referee. It's more about shaking hands than anything else, really. You end up shaking hands about four or five times with the opposition, yeah. the captain, the linesman, the fourth official, the referee. You do it then on the pitch. You do it then. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's just like crazy. But no, it's it's you, that's the only thing as a captain that you kind of get compared to everybody else. You go in for a bit of a chat with the, with the officials and, and pro- before the game, but it's all the same. Uh, thanks for joining me, Joe. That was really interesting. Yeah, no really interesting. Um, so yeah, thank you, and uh, good luck with the rest of the season. Cheers, mate. Thank you very much.